Uh, good morning. And um, today's service is going to be taken by Daniel Lowe. And uh, Daniel, I would just like to give you a special warm welcome to Kilmore here. The only other announcement is that Mark will be back next Sunday. But if you require the service of a minister during the week, if you can contact your own elder or myself, and my mobile is on the church website. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ian. Good morning, everyone. Lovely to be here at Kilmore, uh, all the way from Carrie Duff. So, uh, but it's lovely to be here and to worship together this morning. Let's read from Psalm 100 as we begin our service of worship. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all you lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who has made us, and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. For the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endures to all generations. Great words, and we're going to sing them. We're going to sing Psalm 100 as our first hymn this morning. All people that on earth do dwell. Let's stand and praise God. Let's pray. Oh Lord our God, we approach you this morning as we've been singing as our maker that you have made us and we have not made ourselves. We are not self-made people and we praise and we worship you as our creator that you are the one who spoke by the word of your power and who brought into being the things that are in the space of six days and all very good. And this day, the Sabbath day, reminds us of creation and that on the seventh day you rested. And we thank you that you invite us to rest on this day as well and to take time to worship you and to think of you. Uh, time from our busy weeks. 
We praise your name for your creative power and for the beauty of the world that we see around us in the summertime that we're in, uh, for the wonderful place that we live. Uh, we thank you for the beauty of the countryside and uh, for, for all that we see. But it's our delight to gather together uh, into your gates with thanksgiving and into your courts with praise to be thankful to you and to bless your name. And with the psalmist, we would say that you are good and your mercy is everlasting. And how we need your mercy, O oh God, because we are sinners and we fail you and we have rebelled against you and against uh, your good rule. We have, uh, like sheep, gone astray and wandered off and uh, to our own peril. But we thank you that you haven't uh, dealt with us as our sins deserve, but that you've shown us your mercy. Uh, your mercy in sending your son, the Lord Jesus, to this world for us. Uh, to live in our place and to die in our place. Uh, the just for the unjust. That he might bring us to God, that he might uh, reunite us to you. And we thank you so much. We praise you for your mercy to us in Jesus Christ. And that your mercy and your love and your grace is all that we've ever known. And so we worship you. We thank you so much. And it's our delight to sing your praises this morning. Help us to sing with all our hearts. Uh, to worship you in spirit and in truth. And as we listen to your word, uh, read and preached, that uh, you would help us to focus on it, to concentrate. That you would take away the distractions that come into our minds so quickly. And you would help us to really worship you and that you would do us good by being here together this morning. Because we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, uh, boys and girls and everyone, you'll see a picture on the screen. And I want to talk to you from the Old Testament, from the book of Judges, chapter 7, where we read that God's people were in trouble. And they were in trouble because there were these enemies who were coming in from across the Jordan River and they were riding in uh, this big army of Midianites, they were called, and they were coming in on their camels and they were, uh, they were attacking God's people. They were stealing their crops and their livestock and they would swoop down and they would, they would pinch it all, they would steal it all from them and very soon there just wasn't enough food for God's people to eat and they were in trouble. And they were actually living and hiding in caves um, to, to get away from these Midianites who were, who were coming into their land and stealing their food and, and uh, their crops. So God's people were really in trouble. But what happened was God spoke to a young man called Gideon and God said to Gideon, Gideon, I want you to lead the fight back against these Midianites and to, to save the people from the Midianites. So that was a surprise to Gideon. He had been minding his own business, but God spoke to him and said, I want you to lead the fight back. And so Gideon put out a call for people to come and to join his army. And he, he put out this invitation to men to come and to join his army to fight back against the Midianites. And so people came and people came and joined his army. And actually a lot of people came, 32,000 people came, 32,000 men came to be part of Gideon's army. Now that's a big army. Uh, the British army has about 100,000 at a push, so 32,000 people is, is a really significant force. But God said something very, very strange to Gideon. He said, too many people, Gideon. Too many people. Now, I... If you or I were having to lead a, an army and fight a battle, I think we would want as many people as we could possibly get, wouldn't you? You'd want as many people as you could get if you were having to, to lead an army into battle to face an enemy. But God said, too many people. So what they said was, what Gideon said to these 32,000 men was, he said, first of all, if anyone is afraid, if any of you are afraid, you can go home. 
So, do you think anybody left? Well, yes, a lot of people, a lot of people were afraid. 22,000 of the 32,000 people went home. So he was left with 10,000 people. A whole lot smaller than it was before. And then God said again to Gideon, he said, too many people, Gideon. Too many people. So, so they went down to the river and they had this, it was like a test um, to see how the men would drink. And some of the men, they lay down, uh, they lay right down and they put their, their faces into the water and lapped it up like a dog would lap up water. And they, they drank that way. Uh, a lot of the men did that. And then some of the other men, they, they sort of just knelt down and they scooped the water up in their hands to their mouths and they drank that way. And all of the people that, lapped the water, that lay right down and lapped the water up, Gideon sent those men home. And after that, he was left with how many? Do you know? How many men was he left with? 300 men. So he'd gone from 32,000 to 10,000 to 300. It was a fraction of the size that it had been his army. But God had said, God had said that the army had been too big. And so they ended up with just 300 men. And what they did was, this picture is, is, a, is a, a painting of, of uh, the Midianites in their tents in this big valley. And God gave Gideon the battle plan. And the battle plan was this. He would split the 300 into three groups. He would be with one group. There would be another group on this side of the, of the valley and another group on this side. They would be in three groups of 100 each. And they would get uh, flaming torches in one hand. And they would cover those flaming torches with a jar so that you, could, so you couldn't see the flame just yet. And in the other hand, they would have uh, trumpets that they would sound. And here we read in, in uh, uh, Judges chapter 7 of what happened. So Gideon and the hundred men who were with him came to the outskirts of the camp at the beginning of the middle watch of the night, just as they had set the watch. And they blew the trumpets and smashed the jars that were in their hands. So I have a little bit of a something that might be a bit like the kind of trumpets because they were probably from ram's horns and they were a whole lot bigger than this. But that's just a little mini one from a ram's horn. And they had these trumpets and they had these jars and it says they blew the trumpets they smashed the jars that were in their hands and the three companies blew the trumpets and broke the jars. They held in their left hands the torches and in their right hands the trumpets to blow. And what happened was when they smashed the jars, it made this, it made this great clattering sound. And then they blew the trumpets and it made this big blast on the trumpet. Now, I really can't play this, but shall we have a go? Let's have a go anyway. Okay. Now, I warn you, I can't do this, but anyway. I did tell you I couldn't do it, so you've been warned. Um, they had these big tr uh, trumpets. One more go, shall we? No, it's not supposed to sound like that. It's supposed to sound better, but... Um no, I'll give up. Um, you can have a go at the end. But you have to imagine it, okay? You have to imagine it. A big blast on the trumpets and the smashing of the jars. And all of a sudden, the Midianites woke up from their tents. They heard this, this blast. They heard the, the clatter of, of the jars. And all of these little lights were, were popping up all over the hillside around them. And they thought it was this huge army that was coming. But how many men was it? 300, just 300 men. And they shouted out, when they smashed the, the jars and they blew the trumpets, they cried out, A sword for the Lord and for Gideon. Every man stood in his place around the camp and listen to what happened. All the Midianite army ran. They cried out and they fled. And in the confusion in the middle of the night when they woke up and they heard this, they actually came out of their tents, it says, and they started to fight each other. 
thinking that the enemy was already in the middle of, of their camp. Wow, what a battle plan that that was from God that God gave to Gideon. And they won the victory without even having to fight. Isn't that incredible? And what I think God was teaching Gideon through that and through saying he had too many people in his army was something that we're going to read in our scripture reading in a few minutes from Psalm 118. And there it is on the screen. It's this verse. It is better to trust in the Lord than it is to put confidence in man. Because if, he, if Gideon had been trusting in himself, in his own army, he would have wanted as many people as possible. But God said, no, I'm going to give you the victory. And it's my plan. And you won't even have to fight because I'm going to deliver you from your enemies. And so it's always better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. And just like Gideon trusted in the Lord for the victory, uh, we need to trust in the Lord as well. In our lives, we need to trust him for for wisdom and for guidance, don't we? Uh, to know the right path to take, to know the right way to go through life. Uh, but we also need to trust him as our Savior and as our Lord. Uh, to be our rescuer, to be our Savior, the one who will save us from our sin and who can forgive us and make us good on the inside. Uh, so we need to trust him in every sense and in every way. And it's so much better to trust in him than it is to trust in anybody else. He's the only one who can really uh, deliver us from our sin. And he's the only one that we should be following through life. So could you say this with me? Let's, let's all say it together after two. One, two. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. Psalm 118 verse 8. Very good. Thank you for listening. And uh, now we're going to sing, uh, and it's the song, All Through History. God's been faithful. Let's sing together. God again. The Lord is good, the Lord is strong, and we will live our lives for Him.
Now our scripture reading this morning is uh, that psalm that we've just quoted from, and it's Psalm 118. Let's hear God's word. Psalm 118. O oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. Let Israel now say, his mercy endures forever. Let the house of Aaron now say, his mercy endures forever. Let those who fear the Lord now say, his mercy endures forever. I called on the Lord in distress. The Lord answered me and set me in a broad place. The Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do to me? The Lord is for me among those who help me. Therefore, I shall see my desire on those who hate me. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in princes. All nations surrounded me. But in the name of the Lord, I will destroy them. They surrounded me. Yes, they surrounded me. But in the name of the Lord, I will destroy them. They surrounded me like bees. They were quenched like a fire of thorns. For in the name of the Lord, I will destroy them. He pushed me violently that I might. You pushed me violently that I might fall. But the Lord helped me. The Lord is my strength and song and has become my salvation. The voice of rejoicing and salvation is in the tents of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. The right hand of the Lord is exalted. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. I shall not die, but live and declare the works of the Lord. The Lord has chastened me severely, but he has not given me over to death. Open to me the gates of righteousness. I will go through them and I will praise the Lord. This gate of the Lord through which the righteous shall enter. I will praise you for you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Save now, I pray, O Lord. O Lord, I pray, send now prosperity. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you from the house of the Lord. God is the Lord, and he has given us light. Bind the sacrifice with cords to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will praise you. You are my God, I will exalt you. O oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. Amen. Now we sing again, so let's stand and sing, My hope is built on nothing less.
Now let's pray again and bring to the Lord our prayers of intercession. Oh Lord, we thank you that our hope is in you. It's in nothing less than you, than in Jesus' blood and righteousness. And we, we look at the world and see that so many are hopeless, or so many have false hope, and their hopes are dashed, because their, their hope and their trust is misplaced, it's in the wrong uh, people, and it's in the wrong things. So help us, as your people, to shine your light, and to share with our neighbours, and with our families, and our friends, and everyone that we meet, the hope of the good news of the gospel, uh, that there is hope for um, sinners like ourselves and that there is hope for this broken world because of what you have done. And we think, Lord, of all of the summer outreach that is going on this time of the year and all of the different organizations that are doing such great work. We think of uh, Scripture Union teams, uh, SISM teams, uh, BCM and CEF camps, beach mission teams, Exodus teams, and uh, uh, PCI teams, and so many others. Lord, we thank you for all of the outreach that is going on, for all of the uh, church holiday Bible clubs and camps. We pray that you would be working through each one, that you would be using uh, these efforts that are being made. And uh, we know that these things don't just happen, and so many people have uh, been working for months to, to make them happen when it comes to the summer, uh, to put plans together and getting volunteers. And we thank you for everyone who's, uh, who's a part of those, uh, those from this congregation and, and uh, everyone else. And pray that you would bless them on outreach teams this summer. And we pray that you, they would see your hand at work and they would see uh, you bring boys and girls and young people and uh, families to know and to love you. Lord, you've told us as well to pray for our nation and to pray for our leaders. And at this time of uh, turmoil politically, we pray for our leaders. And uh, we thank you, Lord, for the, uh, the jubilee of Her Majesty the Queen. And we thank you for her. Pray that you would bless her and strengthen her and uh, give her the strength to carry out her duties and to reign over us and that you would be at work within the royal family. And we pray for uh, the Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, in his, uh, in his remaining weeks in office, that you would give him wisdom, that he would look to you. We pray that you would work in his heart and that he would put his trust in you. And we pray for all of the members of the cabinet as they perform their important roles over our country, that, uh, that they would make right decisions and good decisions that would be for the good of all and the long-term benefit of our nation and that each one as well would be trusting in you. We pray for all of the members of parliament, uh, members of the House of Lords, and we pray for the uh, devolved representatives at Stormont as well. And we pray, O oh Lord, that uh, your guiding would be on, the, on uh, that as well and the difficult issues that need to be resolved around the protocol and uh, all of the issues that you know about. And we pray for your direction and that your will would be done and that your kingdom would come. Uh, we thank you, Lord, for the knowledge that uh, those of us who are yours are, are part of your kingdom, and it's uh, a greater kingdom than the United Kingdom. It's a greater kingdom than any nation on earth. And uh, we thank you that we have citizenship that is in heaven, ultimately. Lord, we pray for, for this congregation. I pray that you would bless the congregation of Kilmore and bless the Sprats on holiday and their time off. And we pray that your work would would go on here and would go from strength to strength that you would build up, uh, build us up uh, here, this, this congregation. 
and that uh, new people would come and would worship you here as well. And what we pray for Kilmore, we pray for our, our presbytery of Down, uh, from Carrie Duff to Clock and Seaford, uh, from north to south and east to west, across the presbytery, we pray that you would bless in each church and in each pulpit where your word is preached. And for those um, churches without a minister that are vacant, that you would bring the right one in your time uh, to each one as well. Lord, we thank you so much that you not only hear our prayers, but that you love to hear our prayers. And that you invite us uh, to bring our cares before you and to cast them on you. And forgive us for uh, the times when we are slow to do that. But we thank you for the privilege that it is to bring all these things before you in Jesus' name. And so we do that now. Amen. The RMS Lusitania was torpedoed by a German U-boat. And hopefully there's a picture coming up of this on the 7th of May 1915, just 11 miles off the coast of County Cork. And in the panic and the chaos that followed the torpedo attack, one woman called to the captain on the bridge to ask him what to do. And a passenger who wrote down an account of the events, Charles Laureate, wrote that the captain replied to that woman and he said, stay where you are, madam, she's all right. And the woman wasn't entirely convinced and she replied to the captain and she said, where do you get your information? And he said to her, from the engine room, madam. And the people who were there who heard that uh, put up a shout of relief. And somebody shouted out, the captain says the boat won't sink. And that remark uh, we read in this account was greeted with cheers. And this uh, passenger recorded, he said, I, I noted... I noticed many people who'd been endeavoring, trying to get a place on the lifeboats, turn away in, comp in apparent contentment. They'd put their confidence in the words that they'd heard from the captain that the ship was all right and that she wasn't going to sink. And they'd turned back to their cabins. And yet only 18 minutes after that initial uh, torpedo attack, the Lusitania sank. And it was a great tragedy, as we know. Almost 1,200 of the nearly 2,000 passengers on the liner perished. And if that's really the case, as recorded by those passengers and those words that were said uh, from the captain, what was it that cost the lives of so many? Was it a German torpedo? Uh, yes, I suppose it was. Was it a merciless Atlantic Ocean in which the passengers drowned? Yes. But could it be that it was also something else and that many of those lives were lost tragically because of misplaced trust? They trusted the words that they'd heard from the captain and they weren't right and they were in mortal danger and they desperately needed to get into the lifeboats but they thought that all would be okay. I want to focus this morning on the verse that we've already looked at uh, from Psalm 118 that addresses this matter of misdirected trust. And they're words that are born out of the pain of human experience. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. And I'd like to look at it in two parts. Firstly, the issue of misplaced trust and where would be wrong to, to place our trust and then secondly, in the trustworthy God. So firstly, misplaced trust. And things that the scriptures warn us about when it comes to what we trust in. And the first one, I've got three. The first one is the heart. Don't trust your heart. Don't put your trust in your heart because it has the capacity to deceive you. Jeremiah says, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked or sick. Who can know it? Who really knows how bad the heart is? Who can understand it fully and know its secret motives? 
Another translation of that verse says, the heart is hopelessly dark and deceitful. A puzzle that no one can figure out. Uh, You don't know what you would do in certain situations and I don't know what I would do in certain situations. Disney and DreamWorks and Pixar will give us the message of follow your heart, follow your heart. Let your heart guide you and everything will work out fine. Everything will be all right. But here in the scripture, we're given a warning. It's like a flashing red light. Be careful. Watch out. We all know that there's something not right about our hearts. How many times have we lashed out against the people that we love the most? And maybe afterwards we'll say, I'm sorry, I don't know what it was that came over me. But really, it wasn't anything that came over us. It was something that came from within. It's something that came from inside. And that's the trouble. The problem comes from inside. It comes from the heart. Jesus said whatever uh, comes out of a person is what defiles them. It's from within, out of the heart, come evil thoughts, and sexual immorality and theft and murder and adultery and greed, and malice and deceit and lewdness and envy, slander, arrogance, folly. All these evils, Jesus said, come from inside and make a person unclean. It's the heart. And so it's getting to the heart of the problem. And we need to bring our hearts under the word of God and our hearts and our minds under God's word and to be transformed and to have them transformed by the renewing of our minds, as the scriptures say. And that's the answer, heart transformation. And the wonderful thing is that God promises that. That is what God promises. He promises that we can have our hearts and our minds renewed and we can actually have a new heart. He said, I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh and I'll give you a a new heart. Uh, What a promise. So don't trust your heart. It has the capacity to deceive you totally. It could lead you astray. It's better to trust in the Lord and to ask him to get to the heart of the problem and to transform you from the inside. So that's the first example of misplaced trust. Don't trust your heart. Be careful. Uh, People. Don't trust people. People are weak. Don't put put all your your hopes and all your trust in them. That's the second one. And wasn't that the lesson of Gideon's 300? Uh, 31,700 of the combatants had been sent home. It could hardly have been called an army. 300 people. And the original force had been reduced in size under the Lord's instruction by 99.0625%. God was the victor. And his people shared in the victory. His victory. And a woman or a man standing alone. Never mind even 300. Standing alone with God. With God. That's the key. Is always in the majority. And with God on their side. It's better to trust in the Lord. King David himself the warrior king wrote some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we will remember the name of the Lord our God. In Psalm 20, verse 7. So don't trust in people. It's better to trust in the Lord. But another element to this, instead of thinking generally about people, is also when it comes to individuals, that no individual, no mere human being, should ever become the object of our ultimate confidence. So we should never fall into a cult of personality, whether it could be politically in treating some political leader like a savior, or even it could be when it comes to Christian leaders and role models. And that's highlighted to us in verse 9, where a new emphasis is placed, and he says it's better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in princes. Even princes, even the best of the best, even the most noble, the most revered, uh, the most respected, they aren't one bit more reliable. They are people. And the best of men are men at best. And when we hear or learn of great revered figures that we perhaps had looked to, uh, perhaps from afar off, and had thought of as exemplars of everything that we would want to be, and then we learn that there was some sort of falsehood 
maybe a public persona and, and privately very different. That could shake our faith to the core. And yet we should remember these words from Psalm 118. There's a better way and there's a better person to trust in. One who will never let us down. And we know it's the Lord Jesus. And we must all collectively put our trust in him alone. Because it's better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. So don't trust the heart. It's deceitful. It could lead you astray. Don't trust in people. Don't put all your, pin all your hopes on people because they're weak. Thirdly, yourself. You are weak, so don't be trusting in yourself. If we really do have a heart problem, and if even the best, even the princes among us are in the same boat, then it's so important that we don't create an exception and trust ourselves and end up even sub, uh, subconsciously placing our trust in ourselves through life. Trusting our own, our own merit, our own righteousness. Because we don't have any, we're guilty before God. And when we look at the Ten Commandments, we see that we're guilty before him. When we see his standard of goodness. And when we read the Sermon on the Mount that the Lord gave, uh, where we see that God sees not just the action, but he sees the thought and the motive. He sees the hatred in our mind that could lead to murder. He sees the lust in our mind that could lead to adultery. Uh, we're guilty. And if we're trusting in ourselves, if we're trusting in our moral records, well, they won't get us very far. Because in court charged with a crime, your plus points don't wash. Are you guilty as charged? That's the question. And if we are guilty before the court, we're in trouble. And we know that we're flawed. We're flawed people. We find ways to justify in ourselves what we condemn in others. We're twisted in in ourselves. And if I were to get to heaven the way I am, well, it wouldn't be heaven for long. Because I would wreck it. I need the Lord and I need the righteousness that comes from him given to me, imputed to me, credited to me as a gift. I need to be as Jesus is. In fact, I need our places to swap. I need his righteousness to become mine and I need my record to be put on him to take the blame for my life and my wickedness and my actions. And that is what is offered to us in the gospel. That our places can swap with the Lord Jesus. So don't create an exception and don't trust in yourself when you wouldn't trust in other people. Don't trust in your own goodness and your own righteousness. It is better to trust in the Lord. So don't trust your heart. Don't trust in people. Don't trust uh, yourself and your own righteousness. If you did any of those things, you would be misplacing your trust. But uh, part two, the trustworthy God. We have a God who is trustworthy. But from the very beginning, the devil's tactic has been to present him as untrustworthy. You remember back in the garden uh, as an oppressor, someone who doesn't have our best interests at heart. In fact, someone who would deny us something good. And Adam and Eve had a whole world of plenty. They had a marriage made in heaven. They had fulfilling work to do. They had to tend for and care for everything in the garden. And there was just a single rule, a single possibility for disbelieving God. And what was the serpent whispering in Eve's ear? God knows you won't die if you eat this fruit. Your eyes will be opened. You'll be like God's knowing good and evil. And that lie took hold. The lie that the creator was holding back something good. And in a moment, the trust was gone. And why have any boundary at all? Why even have one rule? Why even have one tree? Why did God put a tree in the garden that they couldn't eat from? Well, without it, Adam and Eve would have had no opportunity to show either their trust or their distrust of God. God gave them that opportunity. 
He gave them a whole universe of yes, as it were, and a single tree of no. A single option for humanity to say, I don't trust you, God. And the lie took hold, and they bought the idea that God was mean, and paradise was lost. But it was a lie, and God wasn't mean. And though at the fall the whole world was plunged into the darkness of sin, God sent the light. And though from the fall we faced the silence of broken fellowship with God, he gave the word and spoke into that silence. And though from the fall we are all doomed to die because the soul that sins shall die, God sent down the life source himself. And though in the fall we had cut ourselves off in rebellion from God to to break, thinking we would break free and everything would be great, He came literally to save us from ourselves. The Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. And I believe if we look closely at this text that we're looking at this morning, Psalm 118, verse 8, it points us to the divinity of Christ. Because only God himself could bridge that gap. If our problem is that we have broken off in rebellion and we have cut ourselves off from the God of life, uh, like the Christmas tree that looks good for a few weeks, but it's been cut off from life and it's, it's dying and it's, it's only a few days before the needles start to fall. And we have cut ourselves off. We have thought that that was breaking free and yet, of course, it's breaking away from, from the God who is life and the only direction is death. And if that is our problem, then only God himself can bridge the gap and can reunite us to himself. And so a merely human saviour would be no saviour at all. And it takes God's initiative to fix. And Jesus is not just a man, but he's the divine man. He's the man who is God, and it's only because he is God that he's worth trusting in. So next time you encounter the Jehovah's Witnesses who believe that Jesus is a created angel, remember it's better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man or in any created being. Jesus is not a mere man. He's not a created angel. He is the Lord of glory. And as we meet him in the pages of scripture, we come face to face with the God we can trust. And his disciples, his followers learned that you could trust him anywhere and with anything. You could trust him with your lunch and he would take it and he would feed the 5,000 and there would be 12 baskets of leftovers. You could trust him with your fishing net and your fishing boat and he would almost sink the vessel with the catch that he would lead you to. You could trust him uh, with your paralyzed friend as you lowered him down through a hole in the roof and he would tell him to pick up his bed and walk. You could trust him with your taxes And he would find a coin to pay them in the fish's mouth. You could trust him in the tempest on the Sea of Galilee. And he would tell the wind and the waves to be still. You could trust him sitting at the well in the heat of the day. And he'll offer you living water. You could trust him at your dead brother Lazarus' graveside. And he would raise him to life. Trust him when he says the time has come for him to die and he'll pay for your sins on a Roman cross. Trust him hanging beside him as a thief on the next cross in a dying act of desperate faith and he'll say today you will be with me in paradise. Trust him in the upper room when he's risen from the grave and you'll say my Lord and my God. You can trust him with your death and he'll give you his resurrection life. You can trust him with your life and he'll give you an eternity. You can always trust him. He will never let you down. Trust that's put in him is never misplaced. A 
on a wet, foggy day in London in the 19th century. I've got a picture coming up uh, to help imagining this. Wet, foggy day, London City, 19th century. A little girl was standing, waiting for an opportunity to cross over the street. And picture the rain and the mud and the slipperiness of the uh, pavement and the rush of carriages and horses and cabs going up and down, back and forward. And so it was quite a daunting prospect for this little girl to get across safely. And she walked up and down her side of the road and looked into the faces of the people who were walking up and down and she was looking for somebody to help her across. And as she looked into these faces, some of the faces looked careless, some looked hard. Many of them were too busy to help, uh, much too busy. But after some time, an older man, quite tall, and he appeared to the girl to have a kind face, walked down the street. And there's next uh, picture. This was the face that the little girl saw. And looking into his face, she thought that somehow this was the kind of person that she'd been looking for. And so she went up to him and she tapped him on the arm and she whispered, please, sir, will you help me to get across? Will you help me to get over the road? And the old man took the little girl by the hand and led her safely across to the other side of that London road. The girl had managed to pick out from the crowd Anthony Ashley Cooper, Lord Shaftesbury, the seventh Earl of Shaftesbury, uh, a devout Christian who had shunned high office but worked tirelessly throughout his life and throughout his career to improve conditions for workers in factories and in mills and in mines, uh, who had tackled child labor and had championed mental health and proper treatment of and care for people in asylums. The little girl had made a really good choice. And Lord Shaftesbury was a knight of the garter. He'd been given the freedom of the city of London. He'd been honoured by politicians, by royalty alike. But one night at a dinner party, he told this story of being spoken to by that girl in the street. And to those men at the dinner party, he said, that little girl's trust was the greatest compliment I've been paid in my life. The greatest compliment in his life that he'd ever received was on a, a wet London day in a crowded arena to be singled out by a little girl and trusted uh, to get across. Well, it's, a, it's quite a metaphor for life, isn't it? Here we are, one side of the road, uh, we're helpless, and who are we going to trust? Psalm 8, 118 warns us about picking the wrong people to trust in. But notice that it doesn't say, you know, don't bother trusting in anyone, it's not worth it. That's not the conclusion. Because we're going to end up placing our trust in somebody. And it could be yourself or it could be somebody else. But whoever it is that you trust in, in your life, you had better make sure that it's somebody absolutely trustworthy. Someone you can trust with your life, with your death, and with your eternity. So like the girl in the street, who are you going to pick out? In the jostling crowd, there stands, as it were, an unassuming man who is, in fact, the Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. Trust him. Let's pray together. Oh Lord, forgive us. Would you forgive us for the times when we put our trust in ourselves in our own goodness, in our own wisdom, or we put our trust in our own hearts to guide the way, or we put our trust in other people who can't bear the weight of that trust. Lord, would you teach us, like you taught Gideon, 
And like you taught this psalmist, that it is better to put our trust in you than it is to put our trust and our confidence in anyone else. Help us to trust in you for, for guidance. Help us to trust in you for wisdom, for direction through life, to go the right way, to make the right choices. Uh, but help us to trust in you for salvation, for forgiveness, and to trust you with uh, not only our life, but with our death and with our eternity, knowing that you are the one and the only one who can lead us safely over. Amen. We're going to finish by singing, To God Be the Glory. Let's stand. Let's, let's really sing it out to God's praise. Say the words of the benediction together. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen.